Leon, welcome to the podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. It's nice to be here. We've we've made the time difference work. <laughs> so, well, in fairness, you've done well, mate, because it's six a.m. <laughs> where you are. So, well done. Time, we we all know times do not exist the second we have little humans in this world. Yeah, yeah so that's very true. So, six a.m. It's it's a blessing. It's all good. <laughs> Yeah, good man. I well, appreciate you coming on and, and chatting to us, mate. We've obviously been tra- talking about this for a while, so it's awesome to finally uh, to meet you and, and get chatting, mate. Obviously, many people watching this, um, you know, certainly from your perspective, will obviously know you from your kind of YouTube days, from the Lean Machines, and obviously from your running. Um, our audience are a little bit more jujitsu based, but you are, of course, a blue belt. Yeah. And uh, now living in Costa Rica in San Jose. So what is jujitsu like in San Jose, mate? Tell us about that. Well, I'm actually uh, in a place called Nosara. So I'm okay. about about three hours. I'm on the coast, about three hours from San Jose on a good day. Uh, Costa Rica, uh, Costa Rica Jiu-Jitsu is, it's so different. Like, I'm not going to sound like, I can try and sound like I know. I've been around for years in Jiu-Jitsu. I'm like two, just over two years into my Jiu-Jitsu journey. But coming from a British, like, strong, heavy pressure, wrestling, dominant, really meticulous like my professor and simon in the uk is like he's an absolute monster as i think every black belt is but he was so pressure dominant coming from a wrestling background and as soon as he was on you you were like okay game over like completely <laughs> just just amazing such a good foundation i learned from him and then when i came over here i was constantly some people love it some people hate it just told her how strong i was i'm like <laughs> basically code for you got no skill for you strong <laughs> so i spent the first two months either just dominating people with pressure and getting some good success against like if you want to call it similar level people who have just standard blue belts um but then getting absolutely destroyed by 17 18 year old boys who were just this like some people call it like the new age of jiu-jitsu that really acrobatic predominantly nogi style back takes from everywhere you know they're standing and you're in like mariposa kind of position and suddenly they're a, they've done a cartwheel and landed on your back and you're like what the hell has just happened <laughs> um so yeah i, I kind of came over here and felt like i was in some ways just starting again I kind of, my professor obviously knew eyes on me. He'd only seen me for a month when I visited last year. He knew that I had a pressure game. He knew that I was obviously very aerobically fit. But skill-wise, it's like, your guard's terrible. You need to work on your guard. And then you need to work on solidifying your positions. You can't just push people over and hold them down here because they've got a lot more mobility than your 36 year old backside you know so <laughs> it's a very it's a very different style very meticulous in in the same sort of sense but more everything is like step by step by step by step and it feels like when somebody like an upper belt who's working towards something on me there's real obvious moments and progressions to you can almost feel that rhythm happening rather than like pressure push hold boom you're there it's like there's to go from passing to all the way to you being submitted could take an extra couple of minutes but they're going to take their time and, and just have you where they want you and it's uh it's it's something to watch <laughs> and feel at times <laughs> Yeah, but is it is it predominantly uh, no gi or gi out there? I was just thinking about the climate. It feels like it would be no gi, but I guess you've got aircon out there, right? No, no aircon, uh, but it's an open <laughs> it's an open air gym. Uh, okay, so I, I say that like it makes a lot of difference. It's still eighty percent, ninety percent humidity, and thirty degrees at six o'clock in the morning. But um, you don't really feel it too much. Like you, you know what it's like. As soon as you get moving anyway, you're sweating your backside off. It's just mm. no gi is. In, like, in my opinion, no gi kind of, I am not somebody who pulls guard. I love wrestling, love stand up. Um, but no gi, after half an hour, it's pointless you start sitting down because yeah. you're going to break a leg. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, predominantly, it's predominantly gi over here in terms of like our academy structure. There's, you know, when you just go on the hierarchy of how many sessions of each, predominantly gi. But I would say that the no gi is more popular. Um, which we'll probably agree now that, you know, culturally it's probably more popular now because, you know, the new age animals who are coming through want to do cartwheels on everyone, you know, so it's, yeah. 
Hey guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new Everyday Black Belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel and it helps us bring you better guests. Yeah, and, and in Costa Rica, where's like the, the main influence? Is it from like the South, from like Brazil and, and South America or is it from the North in, in the States? Yeah, predominantly the, it's, if, I think it's the South because we actually had um, a guy... I'm going to murder his name, Mauricio Sergio, I think it was. And he's like a six stand black belt. And he was the first person apparently to bring like jujitsu to Costa Rica. And he's from the South, I believe. And he came over and his, like his seminar was a gi seminar. And it was unbelievable. Like looking at all these skills with like lapel and, and back take transitions with the lapel and controlling people. And it was like, you know, when you look and you're like, that seems like really old school. It was a really old school, solid, solid system that we worked on that I'm probably never going to be able to hit on anyone for another couple of belts. I'm sure. Um, but that was the, I would say that the, yeah, most of the influence is South. Yeah. Interesting. And, you kind of mentioned about the climate. I trained out in Thailand for uh, for a short oh. period years ago. And it, when you said it was like an open mat, it reminded me because it was the same there. It wasn't, I think it, it was a Tiger Muay Thai. I think they've upgraded now and they've got like a closed like wrestling room with aircon. But when I was there, it was very much just a mat open. And things like staph infections were just absolutely rife because of the climate. Yeah, And I saw that, I think in a recent post, you had a couple of what looked like you know, the second elbow or wrist or something, a, a, a third <laughs> nipple. Yeah. yeah, look at that thing. Oh, is that a staff? Is it <laughs> fuck me? No, so this is actually a spider bite. Um, fuck off. Isn't that what was... everyone says with staff though, mate? <laughs> That's always What's the excuse, isn't it? Like, it's not staff, it's a spider bite. <laughs> <laughs> I can still train. I can still train. <laughs> no, so um, I had a week of it to be honest, where I went over to San Jose, got super ill and I had like a couple of different bites and this one just randomly came out of nowhere. And I was like, what is going on? Went to my local doctors when they pulled the head of it off. It's gone down quite a lot now, but it was basically just a hole, which was almost like a centimeter deep. Yeah. And the infection was just getting worse and it just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And in the end, this sounds really grim, but I pulled it apart because it started to just weep and all the way at the back, it's like this tiny little lump and it had loads of little black, like eggs in the back of oh, it. Oh, so mate, fucking hell. Pulled it all out. And now mate, you're not to selling heal to me, which is not, it, this is part of learning the green, you know, it's we're in green season in Costa Rica at the moment. So humidity is super high. We're still getting a hell of a lot of high temperatures, but then you've also got the contrast of a hell of a lot of rain. So the, I have been told like at the gym, like staff is, is something that is quite rampant at this time of the year yeah. uh, and in general because of the climate anyway. Mm. So there's always like showers on site. You can, as soon as I've done a session, like I'm now like sprinting home, washing <laughs> bacterial <laughs> soap, like all the usual things that you just have to be careful with. Um, but there was one of the guys, he said, oh, could be a staff staff infection i must admit like that was the first time i'd heard of it over here um okay. so i spoke to a couple of guys last night when i was at the gym and they said like one guy had had it about a month ago but they don't see it that often because people are pretty pretty on pretty on top of it it's one of those things isn't it because it's it can be quite a rampant environment so you're a lot more on it and it seems to be if it could just happen it might happen here and there yeah, that's yeah. when people you know get a little bit lazy don't wash the geese go in yeah, with open yeah. wounds and you know we've all got a stinky kid in the gym right uh-huh yeah mate you need to get on uh mr bassett's grappler's soap mate yeah that's where it's at mate it's good stuff that yeah i'll give it a bash 
Yeah. So, mate, I I want to I want to hear a little bit more about how you originally found jujitsu, but I just want to dive into that tantrum with that bite, mate, because it's it's fucking horrendous, mate. And it just sent shivers down my spine when you talked about like the eggs and stuff. Yeah. I mean, how much of a a problem is that in like Costa Rica, like sort of animals and insect bites and that type of thing? Because you've got a few, right? Wasn't there one on your nipple as well? Yeah. Um, that was <laughs> my own. The nipple was my own fault because I am a typical picker. Like if I see a white head, like I, I can see a white head on my, my daughter's calf from a mile away and I'm, I'm zoning in with the thumbs pressed. I'm ready to go. So it's not good. Um, but that was a mosquito bite originally and I just kept okay. itching it. I uh, mm. wouldn't, wouldn't leave it alone. And then in the end, itched it so much that it opened up. And then the next thing I'm itching it, obviously with dirty hands or something like that. And the thing, the difference over here is it's not necessarily that there's loads of issues with different bites and stuff. It's more just they will go infected so fast. Mm. It's not you don't really have a lot of time to get aware of it. And obviously, I'm still quite new to the environment. You know, I've only been living here for six months, so I actually got ill the week before last. And it feels like one of the worst illnesses I've ever had. And it was probably just a cold, but because it was a slightly different strain to what I'm used to back in the UK, it completely floored our whole family. Um, but I think the most common ones, I say common, like it sounds relaxed now, but scorpions, scorpions are the ones you're going to get by accident because like literally the, the routine is like, you can't leave shoes outside. If you leave shoes outside, there's going to be a scorpion or a spider in them in the morning. Um, when you get into bed, when you pull clothes out of cupboards and stuff like that, always quilts and pillows back and move everything to make sure because they're just, they just want to be hidden away in a nice warm environment. Honestly, what you're saying, I couldn't, I, genuinely, I couldn't, I'll be fucking screaming. There's a big spider, there was a big house spider in my um, blinds the other day and I was like, fuck's sake, I had to go get a hoover and thing. She was like, what, Cassie was like, just grab it. And I was like, fuck off, look at the size of it. <laughs> Let alone what you're having. Yeah. Know. yeah, I must admit, no like way. when I when I first got here, you know, you you see you see ants and stuff like that every day, all over the place, like different types, big black ants, big red ants, tiny little worker ants, and they're just like chilling out, doing their thing, surviving. And it wasn't until we just moved quite recently into the jungle. We like living on a mountain now, so like you look out the back door, and we're just basically wrapped by jungle about 270 degrees and then it's just a, a beautiful view out the front and when you're kind of wrapped in it and it's green season you suddenly realize just how alive absolutely every area in which you're living in is and the thing that i've kind of realized is most animals just want to be left alone like they're not like i always had this idea that snakes always wanted to bite you and spiders always wanted to bite you and i even came up with you know burr constrictors and stuff as pets but it wasn't until i actually saw it's really nerdy but i saw this uh, science test that they did where they put receptors in this fake boot and stood on rattlesnakes with this um with this boot and i think it was like a hundred snakes that they they stood on and it only actually bit the person or the, the boot like two or three times so they were doing this thing that like most snakes will will only only just hiss at you because they don't want you to go near them. And it's a bit like that with a lot of animals over here. Mm. You know, the monkeys, the howler monkeys are always just chilling out in the trees. And I'm always like, oh, they're going to throw something at me. They're going to jump down and attack me like a rabid animal. I'm going to have rabies. But most of them, they're just like, all right. And you just, you kind of start, once you start to live a little bit in harmony with them, you just, just crack on. And then, yeah, you get caught out every now and again. We're like, oh Christ, there's a, you know, like I got up in the morning yesterday and there was a tarantula on the veranda that had died. And I was just like, oh, you have that shiver, the nipples go hard and you're like, great. And then 10 minutes later, you see a million ants just carrying it away. You're like, great, <laughs> recycling. <laughs> just, just crack That's on. Wild. Is, there any, is there any more dangerous animals than like insects and spiders and snakes? Is there anything bigger than that? Crocodiles. Um, <laughs> crocodiles is the big one. And actually one thing that did shock me the other day is there's a mountain range that I run around here. And I went into, there's a, of course, there's always an Irish bar. There's this Irish bar just in the middle of bloody nowhere. And we went in there for the first time the other day. And she said there was, I'm sure she said there was like a jaguar or something like that. that just lives in the site, which is like a hundred hectares or whatever it is. She's like, oh yeah, there's a jaguar or some sort of huge mountain cat. 
And I was like, great, okay, really good that I'm running around here completely on my own, thinking the biggest thing that I'm potentially going to see is a howler monkey. You know, there's a, yeah, there's a few, you know, it kind of depends on, you know, you're living in an ecosystem that is starting to develop quite a lot in terms of humans and buildings and stuff like that. So you're kind of starting to press on the boundaries of where all of these wild animals are. So you go down to the beach and there's don't feed the crocodile signs and stuff, which is hilarious. But then normally in dry season, you don't see them because the rivers aren't full all the way down to the outlets onto the beach. Whereas now I have to keep my dog on the lead when we go down to the beach at those areas because he'll get eaten. That's fucking wild, isn't it? Yeah, that's an adjustment, mate. That, that is a big adjustment. Has <laughs> it been a bigger, <laughs> adjust- it been a bigger adjustment a than what you thought? Uh, yes. Yeah. In all the right ways, you know, like there's been, there's a lot of people who see my Instagram and think it just, oh, you know, you just slot it on like a glove. You know, you're now living the other side of the world. There's, you know, simple practical things like this. You know, this conversation has taken a long while to get to this point because of the logistics of seven hours time difference, you know, and I'm working with all of my athletes in the UK, European, there's now some more Americans coming through, which helps, but the time difference and my brand and business has shifted massively. Like the biggest, it's probably been the biggest thing that's had to change so much. Like I had to completely rebrand. And a lot of that started before coming out here, but now it's a completely different model because my, business partner my brother jc of like 10 12 years we're not next to each other funnily enough right now you know and for for all of our business when we first started we were the ant and deck of the fitness world so it required us to be next to each other so a lot of that transition has been strange in that respect and then you know we flew out here with an eight week old son so when you're told as a parent that (laughs) Your kids can't firmer regulate. You're like, great, let's go to one of the hottest places we possibly can. <laughs> and then I've got my five year old daughter. So even just, you know, trying to teach her and get her involved, you know, I've got a bit of Spanish and I, I was okay to a certain certain degree in transactional Spanish. But my daughter's, you know, completely English. So you're you're then trying to integrate them into different school environments and social environments and then also trying to keep a new one alive that basically just lays there like a potato you know so you know there's there's all the different aspects that make it quite challenging Mm. but what we've arrived at now is like for me it's the day-to-day the mundane you know i doing jujitsu on an open mat right where you've got the jungle surrounding you that I would prefer that every single day over doing it in a shed or a garage or an enclosed space. It's just like a simple thing. I'm still going to do jujitsu in the UK, but for me to have the privilege of being able to do it outside, amazing. I do most of my commuting on a quad. Great. I'm still going to commute just the same back in the UK, but I'd rather be on a quad than I would be in a car and the climate and everything like that. So it's a very different way of life and it has its challenges. But the the mundane for me, the general stuff that I'm going to be doing every single day is elevated here, and the way of life is is just better for me. Yeah, and was that the appeal? Then I take it was it just that 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 day to day stuff and how different that is to the UK? Not initially, because we'd only been here for a month. Like we came out for a month for Christmas last year, just as a, a holiday. The initial appeal was, and it sounds really silly, but the initial appeal was the fact that I suddenly didn't care. It was a case of not just being scruffy or something like that, but it felt like I'd been on this probably, you know, self-created. In the UK, I always felt like I had to keep up. I always felt like I was being looked at. I always felt like I was being judged on what I had or what I didn't have, whether it be materialistic or aesthetic, you know, my, my career being aesthetically driven as well, that I always felt watched and I always felt a lot of pressure. And in the nicest way, when I came over here, no one gave a fuck. Like I did YouTube, did Instagram, had all these numbers and blue ticks and no one cared. And it was so (laughs) liberating. Like people were just like, but what are you like as a person? Or what are your family like? What do you enjoy? You know, it was, it was that initial release for me. That was just like, that is golden. And we just saw a much different way of life. Um, and never knew that we wanted to have a second child. And then when we had the actual really open conversation, 
while we were here, we said, if we could bring up a second child in this kind of lifestyle where they're outside predominantly, they get year round sun, they're going to get exposed to so many different ways and sports and activities. And the lifestyle is, is fun for kids. We're like, maybe we will. And if you can go from a pretty much a hard no to a second child to let's get on it, you know, and make it happen, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good sign that you're going in the right direction. Mm, yeah, sounds like some pretty good reasons to move that, mate. Yeah, I still don't, I don't, I still don't think I could get back past the insects. But yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen the film Bubble Boy where he just walks around in that big light? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be it. Mate, I would. I, <laughs> fuck, you know, I, don't, I just don't think I could do it. Just honestly. Yeah, it, I, did, I, I didn't think it, I could, I must admit, you know, it's, it, it's a But it sounds shit. amazing at the same time, you know, that your it lifestyle is. now, I'm, I'm, you know, really jealous, you know. I was just thinking about that then. I was like, oh, it sounds lovely, doesn't it? You know, but I guess it all comes with pros and cons, doesn't it? Well, it's exactly that. Like, I didn't have a bad life in the UK. Like, that, this was the biggest shift and the biggest shock that a lot of my family members struggled with. It's like, but you've got a beautiful home. You've got your home gym. You've got your business, which is great back in the UK. I've had all my friends. I loved my all of my – I still talk to all of my boys. I'm still in my group chat of all my boys from jiu-jitsu. Like, the Be Mean boys, like, we all – we all started training together. Some of them had been there a little bit longer than me. And we'd all, you know, watched each other's blue belt progressions and purple belts and all this sort of stuff in that period of time where we all just supported each other. So, like, there was nothing bad about it. I loved the UK. But I just, I just am the type of person that can't, well, I was talking about being a picker. There's a scratch. You've got to itch it. And me and my wife had spoken about this since two years into our relationship is we want to try living somewhere else, whether yeah. it goes good, bad or ugly. I don't want to be on my deathbed going, should have given it a bash, but I never bothered, you know? So I looked out of my window at home. It was fine, but I needed to change it up and see, see what else is out there. And yeah, I'm glad I did. Yeah. No, awesome, mate. Tell us about your uh, entry into jiu-jitsu in the beginning. You mentioned about the lads back home and obviously it sounds like you got a, a, a good little network there. How did you find jiu-jitsu in the very beginning? <laughs> well, I used to box. Um, so that's what I always have to start with because when I say that I avoided jiu-jitsu like the plague, it was because I boxed. Um, so I boxed as an amateur when I was like 18, 19. My dad used to be a professional, so he got me into boxing at a young age. So always did it just for self-defense because I had a big mouth and I was just getting beaten up by people all the time. So why not learn to defend yourself? <laughs> and then... After I stopped boxing, maybe because of daddy issues and all that sort of stuff, I was like, oh, screw martial arts, screw all of those self-defense things, I'm done. And then um, it was actually JC. He started, God, I'm glad he didn't continue because he'd be an absolute killer now, even though he already is. <laughs> but JC started Nogi and more of like an MMA style really early on in the lean machine. So we're talking like, we're now like 37, he's 37 this year. But he was like 21, 22. But he kept, because it was MMA, it was all no-gi. He just kept turning up to work with black eyes and bruised ribs. <laughs> so he did it for like, I think he did it for about a year, year and a half. But then at that point, it wasn't, it was underground. You know, it wasn't as, it wasn't the, you know, there wasn't the McGregor era, you know, where everything suddenly just pops off and the whole world loves UFC. So he was kind of doing it then when it was a bit grungy and old school and just was like, I can't come to work and be on reception with another black eye. And so <laughs> he stopped then. So I knew of it at that point and was like rolling around hugging men. Now I'm good. You know, we're always trying to keep him away with a jab. So like for me, it's like he never wanted to be close to someone unless you're going to try and throw a body shot or something like that. So the whole concept seemed off for me. And then... I was sponsored by a company called Noco, who are like a pre-workout caffeinated drink. <laughs> do you know? Do you know Taylor Pierman, the one who's just gone ADCC? We just had him on. No, he just won the ADCC trials in Europe, in Europe under eighty-eight. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a jiu-jitsu black belt from Colchester, and he is desperate to get sponsored by Noco. He loves Noco. He, he was on this podcast going, I need to get sponsored by him. We got a little short going out tomorrow. That yeah. should hopefully uh, <laughs> hopefully get him some traction, mate. But if you could speak to him for him, mate, he would definitely he would definitely fucking love it. He wants him on there uh, on his ADCC uh, stuff. So uh, You never know. Like They've got Braulio, you know, Braulio, Steamer, Hall of Famer. He's on there. 
Um, unfortunately for me, like we parted ways. It, it's, you can't really be with a, a UK base arm of the brand when you move to the other side of the world so <laughs> yeah, it was logical enough. it made sense but it was a beautiful three years with those guys but because of that um they were trying to get us like different collaborations you hang out with different people at different events they throw some savage parties like summer parties and nights out and stuff and Bradio nice. is just someone that we had a good affinity with like he's a great human um, you know, off yeah, the map. We've met him a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah we had him on the guy. podcast early. He was lovely. Wasn't yeah, he? he's a really nice man. Um, he knew John before me because of the background. And then um, after having a conversation with him, John actually decided to get back on the mats because he had like a detached collarbone and was like, oh, I'll never be able to do jiu-jitsu again from like a snowboarding accident. And Bradley was like, oh, what, like this? <laughs> and I was like, he was like, oh, fuck, you know, you can still do it. It's like, yeah, it'll be fine. Talking to the guy with like more metal in his neck than bone. Um, <laughs> yeah. but just uh, so JC gets back into it. And then one day we're all having a couple of drinks together. And Bradley was like, oh, why don't you try it, Leon? I'm like, nah, I'm, like, I'm a boxer, mate. Yeah, and I saw that. And then um, John was like, "Oh, what we should do is like we should we should do a collaboration of Leon doing his first ever jujitsu session." So we went up, and Bradley was like, "Come up to Birmingham. Like, we'll we'll use I'll my place. That, yeah, we'll use my place. We'll do a session. Um, you know, basic single leg takedown. I think it was, and and some other stuff to mount. And I hated it because I came out and was like, "Oh my god, I need to start." And I, I, I think that's what it was. It's like you need to, I think with jujitsu, when you look at it from a distance and you haven't got a clue what it is, yeah. it's really hard to understand the appeal. I think personally, apart from when you see someone do something really cool and really acrobatic, because there's so many technical points that are going on. Like we actually did the session and then at the end, he was like, oh, I'm only going to use, I'm only going to attack this one arm. So let's just have fun. And I was like, well, he's got one limb to play with and helicopter arm bars me straight away and all sorts of stuff. And I'm like, wow, to have that level of skill and is just mind blowing. But then also the other thing that isn't as wonderful, but the first time he mounted me and broke my posture and I couldn't move, I just saw my young daughter and was like, I think that I'm physically like capable and can look after myself, but to have someone literally all he do did was put his elbow the other side of my head and bend my spine. I think it was and push pressure down with his hips. I was like, I am fucked. Like, and I'm an athletic guy and, uh, and having a young daughter in this modern world, I was like, I need to arm her with skills where she could defend herself if the worst, 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 worst thing were to ever happen. And that was it. As soon as, as soon as we'd finished the session, I was like contacted Sai Tukan Academy, which is where I started training in the UK and was like, I'm going to run the length of, or I, was, I was planning a, I was running 250K across Sri Lanka, like three weeks later. So I was like, I can't come in and do anything crazy beforehand, but I want to set that intention that I'm going to come the week that I get back. Um, signed up. And then that was, you know, the rest is history, as they say. But what a mm. place to start with a Hall of Fame. Yeah. Yeah, start, mate. It's all downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> but mate, that's, but that's, that was maybe the difference though, because if you'd met somebody else who didn't inspire you in the same way and have that level of skill to make you feel so vulnerable, yeah. It, it may not have been enough to make you pull the trigger, mate. But you say that, though, but that's what you done to me. You got me in a cage when I first started. You'd already started at this and point. <laughs> not long, maybe like a week, two weeks, and he got me in a cage and made me feel like a fucking child. Yeah. So <laughs> probably guillotined me 10 times, I reckon. Brilliant. And I, I went away from there and I was like, you're not even a man, really, mate. You know, you got a fucking... <laughs> you, got, you got your ex-boss literally beating you up for an hour for fun. He didn't even look like he was tired. And I was like, at the time... I was like 17 and a half stone thinking I was strong as fuck and he was just play, playing yeah. with me and I couldn't get my head around it. But it is a different, it is a type of person and character though, isn't it? That I think yeah. brings you in because it like, I, I guess in some ways it's a, it, for me, if you'd done, I'd been in that situation when I was 18, I'm not sure I would have taken it in the same way. You know, like I had situations with, with blokes that would come into boxing I get in and we'd be doing some easy round sparring 
and they would take a real exception to the fact that a person younger than them or smaller than them was hitting them. And it would become really, really aggressive really, really quickly and send them the complete opposite way. But I think when you get into those kind of environments with close quarters, contact sports and martial arts, if you're, if you're brought to that point by the right character or the right person, whether they're in your life at that point or they're not, I think that's the the catalyst because I had it with CrossFit. You know, I would have been doing CrossFit two years earlier if it wasn't for the egotistic maniac who I had my first experience with. You know, he just opened a gym local to our to our city. We were popping off on YouTube and he asked us to come down and do a workout and then just fucking brutalized us, did a workout that was way too skill, way too aggressive, basically because he just wanted to show off on a camera. And I was just like, I now don't want to do this because I've now seen an ego that is not nice. I've now seen a few exercises that have left me absolutely trashed and I cannot move for the next week. There was no appeal. And, you know, Braulio could have done just the same. Come in, taught me absolutely nothing but how to be bow and arrowed really bloody hard or something like that. But it was just, he's a phenomenal professor, you know, and I think it's... uh, you know, getting guillotine, guillotine 10 times or be it having your posture broken, you know, it just, it just hits you different if it's, it's delivered in a slightly different way. Yeah. And in, and in my defense, I knew you well enough at that point to oh, know yeah, we you mates. take it no, the right yeah, way. Yeah. Not, he wasn't like horrible with it. He just, every time I put my head in a place where I shouldn't, <laughs> he choked me. Got pulled off. <laughs> it's, my own fucking, it's my own fucking fault. And then the next the next round, I'll put my head exactly in the same place and he choked me again. <laughs> Just teaching you. Tough love. <laughs> Mate, it's, it. it's, do you know what? It's saying shit, but you need it. You need yeah, it sometimes, 100%. especially when you first start. You need to know that, you know, there's um, not even like a pecking order, but you, d- you need to know that you don't know. You know, you don't yeah. know what you're fucking doing, even though you think you do. You don't. Yeah. You don't have a fucking clue. You don't even know how your body works. Body mechanics, you don't even know. A person no. off the street, they don't even know. Yeah, no, I I still live my whole jiu-jitsu journey like I haven't got a clue what's going on. Yeah, it's the best way, you man. You can learn from every single person that comes in. I, I rolled last night with a kid who was, he was probably 16, 17 years old, about my sort of size, and I approach him like he's a black belt. Because he, in some ways, he's going to be even harder work because he's got less skill at the same time. But every, I used to just... Even when I first came to came to Costa Rica, I was looking at people based on their belt color or their size and having my approach based on that. Whereas now I'm like, every single person that I roll with could cause me so much hassle or could be the softest role in the world. I'm just going to go in like they're all black belts. Yeah, that's the attitude, I think, mate. So you grow. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, mate, you mentioned uh, a second ago about some running that you do. Just a little bit. <laughs> So you said about the Sri Lanka thing, and obviously you you ran the length of the UK as well, which to me, who've I've done one half marathon in my life, and I thought my hips were going to explode. That's the same as me, mate. I was the, not a runner. So so for me, mate, I, I I I'm fascinated by anybody who's able to to run that distance. But but for those that maybe aren't familiar, tell us about that that UK challenge that you did, mate, because that was pretty epic. Yeah. So traditionally, it's called joggle. Uh, or Le Jog, John O'Groats to Land's End, or Land's End to John O'Groats going south to north. And John O'Groats is the most northern easterly point of the entire United Kingdom in the arse end of nowhere in Scotland. And then you've got the most southerly westerly point being Land's End. So essentially, if you want to draw the longest straight line across the country, they're the two points that you do. And it's traditionally like a pilgrimage that people do on bikes, road bikes. Um And by a very, very niche group of people, it's an ultra endurance run or a hike. You know, a lot of people walk the hike for like 30, 60 days or something like that. I actually think, um, oh, who was the singer who did it? It's going to come to me in a second. But during COVID, uh, I think it might have been George Ezra. I think he walked it with his guitar and one of his mates over over COVID or something stupid like that. What a savage. And basically, the... The route is somewhere between 850 miles, right? Something like that. And I say somewhere between because you can take A roads, you can go over mountain ranges, you can do, you can make it as a straight line as you possibly can and all the rest of it, or you can go around the houses. And um, I decided that I wanted to run it in 14 days or less because it was a nice symmetrical number. (laughs) 
It's good enough reason, I suppose. (laughs) What I didn't realize, um, because at this point, just for context, I'd only been doing ultra endurance for two years. So I'd done a 50K ultra, I'd done a 250 across Sri Lanka, and then did a 250 across the Wadi Rum Desert in Jordan. And then I was like, I'm going to be leaving the UK. What a way to say goodbye. Let's run the length of it, film a documentary, have a wild time. And um, my naivety at that point to what it was is it's laughable now. Like 250K was the furthest I'd done over five days. And the first by two and a half days into that event, I'd already surpassed that. So let's see what happens. (laughs) Um, So it was 1,347 kilometers was the total distance that I clocked. And I ran it in 13 days, 15 hours and five minutes which ended up, I'm still waiting for the official list to come out, but I think it's about the sixth or seventh fastest time in history, which is unreal for me. But at the time, I actually thought that was a slow time because all I'd seen was the world record by some savage ultra endurance goat of like just under 10 days. And even apparently, you know, one of his times is questionable or something like that. Some people say they're just driving a car and then just taking photos and places. There's, <laughs> there's, there's weak people in the world everywhere mentally who just need the social punch. Um, but yeah, so set off and you're seeing the documentary. It was, it was wild, you know, six months before I'd come back from Costa Rica, got back on the mats in the UK and grade three ruptured my MCL with an awkward fall uh, in jiu-jitsu. Just, so that's, a, that's a full rupture, right? Yeah. So essentially it was still the good thing. Origin insertion points were still intact. So essentially like grade three, depending on who you speak to, and it's probably really helpful information for people so you don't crap yourself like I did beforehand. Where, it, where the paperwork just says I had grade three MCL, grade two LCL. And I was like, great, that's fully ruptured. It's hanging off, done. But it's actually a classification of, I think it's like 73% of the fibers gone. So it's classified as, once it's super deep, they'll classify it as ruptured. But if you've still got fibers intact, you don't want to start bugging around with joint capsules and cutting things open and taking parts of hamstrings and all this sort of stuff. Just blood flow. And staying away from it and, and getting everything around it strong is a really good way to rehab. So I found out that it was grade three, spoke to my specialist, and they're like, well, have you got fibers in play? And I was like, I don't know. So then had to go pay private to find out that actually I still had fibers intact. Um, so the first two and a half months of my six-month prep was rehab, uh, strength and conditioning, not really doing a great deal of running. And then came back in the middle of April, ran a marathon with a friend. The following week, ran a 75K uh, ultra one-day event, which was the furthest I'd ever run in one go because obviously traditionally with the day-to-days. 75K. That is fucking outrageous, mate. It was uh, outrageous. yeah, when I ran um, that half marathon, twenty one k, that that just that was me doing it on a Saturday, and that fucking brutalised me. I, I know the South Downs very well, so I, I've done the Oxfam Trail Walker twice. Yeah, so that's that's uh, Petersfield down to Brighton across the South Downs. It's it's a walking event, but it's a hundred k, so it's sixty two miles. Oh, you told me about that. Yeah, yeah, the Gurkhas run it, and you get running teams that do it. Yeah. So I, I know that terrain and I also know that distance very well. So mate, fair play, <laughs> fair play. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that was that was it in a nutshell. That was the prep. Um, again, naively, I was like, I was living mentally off the two 250s I'd done the week, the year before. So I was like, I've got plenty of volume in my legs. I've been there mentally to a certain degree. So we'll just prep the best we can. And I think I finished with five days of marathons back to back, five day marathons. Um, and then the prep was done. And to think like, you're going into an event, and when I think about it now, of where I'm going to be running about 100 kilometers a day, which is about two and a half marathons, a little bit less. A day. Per day. And you've prepped to the point of one marathon per day. You know, there's always like a cutoff point. But realistically, I needed to have what I would have classified as like a seesaw peak where I would have had a marathon one day and then a 50 or 60 the next and then another marathon and then maybe another 55 like that's what I should have done but I just didn't have the time and the risk of 
<laughs> it was hilarious the risk of injury um off the back of that mcl like i still didn't really know how much i could stress test it beforehand and i just thought for me the way that my brain works is i'd rather get into the event and have to stop after two days because the mcl is just buggered than just not show up at all and go oh, i need to look after this and you know see what happens i didn't want to get get it smashed in the event um but get it smashed in the prep i'd rather get it smashed in the event so yeah, then we just rocked up and we went to hell and back. So what was your, I always think with this sort of stuff, what was your daily mindset like, you know, when it's getting really tough, what keeps you going at that point? Because I know I, I, if I'm doing a 5K, mate, I'm thinking, I can't wait to stop. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, I'm like, I, I was like, fucking hate this. I can't wait to stop. What are you like at, I don't know. What's your mindset? 50K in and just like knowing you've got another 50 to go and just how do you keep yourself motivated to do that? So there is a few different aspects, you know, there's a lot of people and I hate this, you know, I, I had a bit of a rant about this on social media um, because there's a lot of people who talk about mindset and discipline and just show up, just do the hard thing, just get dark and you'll be able to get through it. And it's, and, and yeah, surface level, that's great. You know, showing up and just going hard. And now there's this, nature of raw dogging things like people, oh, i'm gonna go raw dog a marathon in a pair of jeans and i'm like great well fucking done but what did you gain from it apart from chafe yeah you know it's like it's all about why you're gonna raw dog something it's not a case of a lot of people now are just doing because it's social credits and i always think when you're doing something like what i did there has to be more reason than just social you know social clout so for me, like you guys will know Sam and the boys from Reorg, like they're, they're the charity that I wanted to raise money for. And I had a huge affinity with them. And I was like, as soon as I'd been exposed to that charity, I just cared, you know, and, and, and I, and I say like, and I'm happy to say it, if I'd done it for, you know, I know people who have had cancer and had that kind of stuff in their family or just within my family. But if I was doing it for cancer research, UK, it wouldn't have had the same effect. And it's not because I care about the cancer, cancer I don't care about it. And there's not, nothing like that. It's nothing personal. It's purely just there's an affinity. And as soon as you meet a brand or a charity that just connects with you, it care, you care more and it matters more. And as soon as I met the guys from Rio, I was like, I want to do this for them. So then there's that. I'm representing something bigger than myself that I care about. And there's people who have been through fucking far harder things and still have to deal with it today than what I was going to be dealing with. So then there's, there's that aspect. Then there is the small, small aspect of, for me, like I funded the whole entire entirety of this documentary. I had a six man crew. I put everyone up. I traveled everyone. I fed everyone. So I was, I think the event cost me about 25 grand personally. And there's no two ways about it. It doesn't matter who you are. You dump a ton of money into something like that and you're about to move your entire family to the other side of the world and you're taking up the time to prep. You better have a bloody good go at it because unfortunately, the way that social works now and the world works now, if I don't finish that, no one cares. And not that everybody cares anyway that you finished it, but it really matters that you get it done. So there was that kind of pressure. And then the final thing, um, that really added to that is that I just can't quit. I'm just not somebody who is very good at stopping when I'm doing something that I said, you know, it's like that thing of do what you said you were going to do. Like I have such a stubborn mindset in that respect where I'm like, if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So every single day was hard. Like the first three days of a hundred kilometers were a party. Like it was just, it was wild. I'm like, waves of gratitude of waves of pride of like I've, all the stress of building this event all the stress of the injury and the rehab and the worry i'm like it's happening we're running through the ken Gorns. i'm getting burnt to a crisp my legs are fucked but this is great you know you have all of that and then the transition to like day four to day nine, I genuinely don't think I smiled once. Really, like my mental health was not in a very good place. But in some ways, I try to contextualize it, it to a place where people can understand it. So that your audience being predominantly jujitsu based, right? It's very, very different, but it's the same in some ways that I'm like, 
But why would you continue to go to jujitsu and get that absolute crap kicked out of you, get choked nearly to blackout? You come out, you've probably broken your ribs before, you get a panda eye every six months, you're always aching somewhere. You go through that white belt transition in jujitsu and I'm like, but you keep showing up because there's something there and you might not know sometimes what it is. <laughs> sometimes you get your ass beat so bad that you're not sure, but you keep showing up. And that was the only way that I can describe and contextualize it the same as in comparative, I guess, with, with the ultras for me, is there's something about being that raw. All the filters are gone. All the worries are gone. Like I say, I could have shit my pants on the side of the road and wouldn't have cared. And to have that feeling of freedom in a world that is so connected and so watched all the time now, it was, it was a privilege. So it got really dark and it got really hard. And I was, you know, there was a couple of days where I couldn't run. My body just refused to run. My ankles had blown up. My right knee looked like a football. And I walked for 23 hours straight to get 100 kilometers in, then slept for like two hours and then did the same again. Slept for two hours, did the same again. My feet, all of my, like both my heels essentially fell off and the bottom pads of my feet were absolutely trashed. But um, it wasn't... it. I always say, like, please don't ever look at it as like this David Goggins thing because David Goggins is hurt. He's an ill man and he does it because he can't exist in this world without that pain, if you ask me. Whereas for me, it was a challenge and it was something that I was excited by. And as dark as it got, it got really dark at times. I was still always in the understanding of I'm doing what I want to do not a case of I need to do this. I can't exist if this doesn't happen. For me, it was still like, this is a savage challenge. And at every, at every single day, at some point I was like, I'm a fucking savage. We're getting this done. <laughs> yeah. Even if I wasn't smiling or particularly having a good time sometimes, I was still like really proud. Yeah. And I think that's the that's the thing. So how much how much weight did you lose doing it? I I seen a photo and you and you looked pretty skinny, mate. <laughs> I think it was um about nine kilos. Yeah, it was pretty bad. And how many calories were you on? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, clearly. But <laughs> so I needed to be I needed to be having about ten thousand to eleven thousand calories a day. But with the rehab prep, I hadn't you have to prep your gut to be able to take on more calories. And I hadn't done that prep. So for me, like I know in hot environments and endurance based environments, my appetite goes anyway. So I always start to shift towards a drinkable carbohydrate, easy way, hydration plus calories going in. Um, so I always, always knew it was going to be hard to get the amount of calories that I needed because you need to have fatty edible calorific meals as well to just get more calories in and i remember on like day nine i had a mcdonald's and i thought this was the, it was the best day of my life because <laughs> i felt unreal afterwards um but yeah i was probably having about four thousand calories a day which in normal terms is almost double what i would exist on but i was getting nowhere near what i needed and yeah the weight was just when i look at the photos now and i look at i looked at the final documentary draft the other week I look like a shadow of a man, like just gone. Was, obviously, you're tired and all the rest of it, but it was just, I was just getting smaller and smaller. It was wild. And how quickly did your weight bounce back? Quite annoyingly quick, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Before you do a jujitsu compact like 70 kilos. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think physically, I, I, I returned to a normal state faster than I did mentally. Um, like physically, I was kind of, back to a certain form of normal uh, apart from like I had a really bad issue we called a status pubis where essentially if I laid on my side I couldn't lay with my knees together because my pubis symphysis was fucked so I basically for eight months I laid with a pillow between my knees because I thought I'd basically just done some damage that was is going to be irreversible but it was because I continued to train like six weeks after running the length of the country I went over to Munich and ran a marathon idiot for a brand uh, so you know there was some of the physical ailments like that that stuck around but generally body wise 
I was back to normal within about six to eight weeks after getting back, lifting some weights, filling, filling back up, you know, two or three kg came back almost overnight with Mm. water and refilling your muscles and glycogen stores. So I was like a little bit, a little bit there quite quickly. Um, and then mentally afterwards, it was just like PTSD for about six months. (laughs) (laughs) But not enough to put you off running though, mate, huh? No, no, not enough to put me off. Um, unfortunately, for I feel sorry for my wife. Um, running is just everyone's got their thing, right? I think some people love to journal, some people love to walk, some people love to do jujitsu. But for me, like running is, it's a, I call it a filtration system. Like for me, whether I'm stressed, whether I'm happy, whether I'm sad, whether I'm angry, like even to be completely straight and open and honest with you guys, I was really looking forward to having this conversation. And then the other day when everything was confirmed, half an hour later, I was out for a run because I'm like, right, I'm going to have a conversation with these guys. What are the type of things that could potentially come up? I want to put the best account of myself across. I want to have a really good conversation that feels like it works for everybody. And I'm like, how do I do that? I'm not somebody who can sit down and just think about things. I'm like, I need to move. It just Mm, feels like all of the stickiness mentally just freeze up as soon as yeah. I start moving. So, and I'm I've got, I'm privileged to have one of the most beautiful mountain ranges and the next street across that is absolutely spectacular. But nobody runs it because it's too too heavy. So I'm like, I get up there and I got it to myself. It's great. <laughs> yeah, mate, it sounds fucking epic. But mate, it was a hell of a challenge. It, like, fair play to you, mate. And when you were talking a moment ago, you kind of said a couple of things that that kind of resonated a little bit but you kind of listed about three or four different motivating factors yeah and i always find that's like so useful to to try and harness about 10 years ago i had a couple of mma fights and i'm not much of a fighter really mate at heart this is a brown belt <laughs> <laughs> i just like to hug people well that's cuddle therapy mate that's different um but obviously mma is it's obviously slightly different stakes right than competing in jiu-jitsu um, but I did it for whatever reason at the time. And I remember when I was training, you know, obviously the training is very hard and quite often I'd want to quit. And I remember at the time I just had multiple things, obviously not wanting to get beat up. That was a, a big motivating factor. Of course. But, you know, it wouldn't be the first time. So that, there were points where I was like, oh, it'd be fine. <laughs> um, the other thing was not letting people down, you know, and then even just having abs like, at that point for fighting, you know, it was all these different things. And I found that when you've got multiple motivating factors, if one fails, you've still got the others, right? And yeah. by the time you've lost a couple, you've regained the other ones. And I found that was a really great way to, to motivate me and just keep me going through those sort of those, those dark periods of that training. So I thought that was great when you said about that. Yeah, I think it's unfortunately in this world when people are trying to sell something, right? Not that I hate social media, I love it. There's some great people out there. But when it comes to social media, unfortunately, the audience is fickle. So you have to simplify and niche out your point to the nth degree for people to kind of connect to it. So if I try to essentially, or, you know, the Goggins of the world try to sell three or four different aspects and say, you know, make sure that all of these matter, people don't care. They want one single blue pill that they can swallow down and say, this is how I stay motivated. This is how I stay disciplined. And for me, like nowadays, the biggest thing that, I say to people like my athletes, anyone training for anything, the same as myself when I'm doing it, is I am phenomenally, like we spoke about it briefly before getting into the call with jujitsu, I'm phenomenally process driven. So when it comes to like at the moment, I'm training to run 220K in Nevada and it's going to be a great race. But by the time that race gets there, I won't care about the race anymore. Because what you realize with a lot of the stuff, like you probably realize yourself, Paul, when you were training for the MMA fights is what you gained from that experience, you gained before you even stepped in the cage, which was the showing up, doing what you said you were going to do, the progression, the knowledge, the experience, the habitual things that you're going to take forward. Like I think 80% of the way through a prep, I've gained everything and more that I hoped to gain from the actual preparation. The actual race was just an anchor point in time for me to start to work towards. And I think for a lot of people, if you want to be motivated, if you want to be disciplined, if you want to be all of those things and you want to gain progression in any area, use something as a point to put in the future 
but then really indulge in every single step in process in the process that you take because that's the that's where the magic is and unfortunately it's just not sexy enough for people to buy into yeah very true mate i do completely agree it was actually something that taylor pierman said um again to, to mention him but he said if you want to get better at jiu-jitsu sign up for a comp because that yeah. will force you to to get in the sessions you don't want to do get in the rounds you don't want to do yeah 100 yeah. percent well it's literally what i've done yeah. end of september i've booked one i've paid for it I've, I've uh, got six ki- five kilos to lose and I'm like right yeah. I'm going to fucking do it you know what I mean so I've got to do it and you've just said it on a podcast yeah I've just said it on a podcast I've got to do it end of September done there we go <laughs> clip that it is what it is <laughs> isn't it <laughs> Danny's Danny's jiu jitsu is now going to explode. Like having a having a time, you know, the second you put a time stamp on something, something that you're working towards, that's it. You know, you you'll be lasered in. You'll show up, like you say, you'll show up so much more. You'll show up with more intention. And you know, I've done something similar with my training, which is not a fight, but I've now approached my approached my training like an analyst. And it's you're showing up with intention every single time. And I think we all have these transition points with everything that we're doing where suddenly it goes from oh just this random hobby and some you know male and female time to just hang out and do something here where you've all got something in common and it becomes something you're like okay cool i'm locked in now you know and that's that's very similar yeah 100 percent. and the other thing that you mentioned as well which uh, i liked mate is when you said about when you were just out running and you just felt like a bit of a wild man like a badass and that you didn't care yeah. Um, and again, just draw my own experience. So I, I did. A, I went for a period of doing like obstacle course races. I did the Spartan Beast, if you're familiar. Yeah. <laughs> in Midlovian, up in Edinburgh, and me and my mate just used to lean down for it. We used to put on these little little shorts and we used to go out running. <laughs> and I, it, it reminded me of a of, of a race that, that race that I did where we were up on this big hill, freezing cold, and I was just loving it because I was out yeah. in the middle of nowhere, just basically in a pair of shorts with a yeah. headband on just running and just trying to get to the next point and it was fucking great mate and i think uh, again like a lot of people don't don't have that in their lives these days do they they don't get yeah. out in the wilderness and just let go just of be. you know yeah you know where it, it sounds you know i I'll, every saying every single time i say this on anything i get torn down by an aggressive feminist but i say <laughs> it for women just the same as men for human beings we're primal get outside like yeah for us, like we've moved to this this house, like it's a huge, this sounds really ridiculous because you've got such a beautiful view, but it's a huge downgrade in our life because we're having to save money to be able to buy the house and some land over here that we want to buy. So we've kind of like downgraded our life in some ways, but we've become more connected with the outside. Whereas we're like in this big compound and beautiful pool and like you never saw the outside world. And we didn't realize how much that was affecting us as a family because you were outside the inside. It sounds really weird. But here, I take literally five steps from my bedroom and I'm outside in a jungle environment and I can hear the monkeys, I can hear the cicadas, I can hear everything happening. And there is something about that grounding process where, like for me, like I say, I just go out and run. But for some people, I'm like, if you're stressed, if you're frustrated, if you're worried, if you're annoyed, if you're feeling like the anxiety is going through the roof, get outside. And I guarantee you that you will feel 50% better literally just being outside. And then when you go and do something like the Spartan like that, you then get that whole, like everyone talks about runners high and stuff, but you get that whole like, I'm a savage. This is unreal. <laughs> like, is this happening? You know, like some of the conversations <laughs> that I had in those first three days of joggle and the last two days of joggle when things started to feel like they were actually going to get done were the purest and most beautiful conversations I've ever had, but it's almost like childlike. It's the simplicity of them and the perfection of just, oh, we're just out here running, living. And it's like, <laughs> why does that matter in every you know day-to-day life? But it's, it's that when you're reduced to absolutely nothing but the present state that you're in, that's when you start to appreciate those sort of things. And it's one of the reasons I love being outside. Yeah, mate, brilliant. Yeah, I, I saw a post before you did the run actually, where you invited people just to join you at various points. Did yeah. you get many people join join and run with you? I would say that I had about ten people join me physically, um, but what I did have, which was super overwhelming for me, was so many people found the route and went out and graffitied chalk signs put up laminated signs on fences and stuff like that. So people kind of went out 
to support. And I was like, one point I was running up this hill in the middle of nowhere in the dark, dark, pissing down rain. And there's someone just stood, and I feel really bad for this. I still do to this day because I was so out of it that I, I didn't stop. But these people have basically stayed at the top of this hill with a sign just saying, go now and keep going, blah, blah, blah. It's like nine o'clock at night. I've done, I've slept one hour in the last two days and it's, a, it's pissing down. I'm like, yeah, thanks, and carried on. And for every moment, that's passed since then i feel so guilty because i never stopped to even say hello to this person and normally i'm pretty good with my p's and q's um but I, but i didn't i didn't stop but there we go there we go but i guess, mate, I guess you show gratitude by by keeping going and, and getting it done though mate so um yeah so, i yeah, think so and also bad. as well like with those kind of challenges it's not like i'm doing a circle I'm doing an A to B point. And at some points, you know, I'm running 250, 300 kilometers down the A9. And that's not a road that you want people joining you on because the health and safety implications mm -hmm. of that are ridiculous. And then when you're doing 100 kilometers a day, you're going a very long way. So like the people that did come to join me, you know, even some people drove from Norwich and came across the country to Wales to come and join me to run one day for 30 kilometers and then go home. You know, so the people that did come, I'll never forget those humans ever. Um, but everyone who supported me got behind me from even just people going, you've got this, like before even going, I'm like, for somebody to turn around and support you enough and be stupid enough to think that you can run 13, 1400 kilometers without having an MCL intact right now is wild. So yeah, it was, I was supported in very many different ways and the people who did come, they came in and did 10 K. Some people came in and did 30, 40 K. Um, but a lot of the support was predominantly virtual mm. or went unseen physically. But then I would just see like this random, like my slogan in business is brick by brick, which is my run company. And they would just be like brick by brick written on this bridge in chalk and then keep going there and then pictures it was yeah it was it was crazy yeah that's amazing mate and you, you obviously said you were doing it for real how much money did you raise for them in the end so far it was about 11 and a half grand i think Brilliant. it is so far um and then when the documentary comes out we're hoping to raise some more which would be really cool yeah perfect so there's is there like a just giving link or something that's yep. still live then yeah yep, yeah there is. perfect we'll, we'll make sure we get that in the description for you mate yeah thank you Awesome, man. Um, take us back to Lean Machines, mate, because obviously you've done very well on YouTube and obviously you're a, you're a coach and everything else. And we've uh, we've mentioned it a few times. But yeah, wh wh where did that come from? How did that start? Well, me and JC were just best friends. Simple as that. Like That was the easiest way to segue into that is that we were best friends, hung out skateboarding, both turned 18 at the same time, went out and got pissed, had a great laugh. Um, just build some memories. And then I did my backpacking experience, went traveling with my ex-partner, Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, did the thing, came back, evolution of man, I'm now an adult, like what the hell has happened? There's a whole world outside of England and Magaluf, who would have thought, <laughs> um, a big wake up call. And then I get into the fitness industry, like I'd, I'd always been fascinated by human biology, like I had asthma as a youngster and never thought that I could run, never thought I could train without having an asthma attack. And then my PE teacher helped me through this transition of realizing that so much of my asthma symptoms were anxiety and the fear around having an asthma attack because being out of breath generally in life feels just the same as the first stages of having an asthma attack. So I kind of worked with those and weaned myself off an inhaler. And at that point, that's where the fascination of movement and training and physiology and everything like came from. So it was always going to be something that I was interested in, but never really had the confidence to speak to somebody or have the thought of, sta the thought of standing with someone for an hour and taking them through a session was like so, so far beyond what I thought I could do. I was a roof tiler, so I was only on the roof with my dad and maybe another laborer most of the time. So I was my my speaking skills were terrible. I remember he'd tell me to go and get the extension lead plugged in, and I'm walking up to the door like, I can't, I've got to speak to someone I don't know. <laughs> you know just to ask them to plug an extension lead in. Um, so it was terrible. But traveling teaches you to speak to people and communicate with different languages. You know, when you have to become more expressive and and it's things like that that you suddenly start to learn those skills, came back, 
got my level two qualification for I was a scientist or a doctor at that point with my level two fitness instructor. Uh, got a job um, serving coffees, made an absolute bang in cappuccino for about a year and a half and then got promoted into the gym floor, did the usual route, level two, level three, um, GP referral stuff. And then JC or John, I always call him JC, went traveling at the time that I was working in the gym. And he said the same, like he's like, he basically contacted me while he was in Australia and was like, I'm going to be coming back. Um, would you have a problem if I was to get into the fitness industry as well? And I'm like, doing the thing that I love with my best friend. Yeah, of course I'm going to have a problem with it, mate. It's going to be horrendous. <laughs> um, no, so I spoke to um, the manager's gym and got him a essentially like an interview. He came in and worked again, came in and worked as a receptionist for about nine months and I believe when he first started, he was actually doing it for free, like work experience. He was still doing his carpentry stuff. Um, and then fast forward two years later, we're working in a gym and his family came up in the first wave of YouTube. So they were doing like, they were makeup artists and the first wave of like vloggers and daily vloggers. So there was always going to be that connection at some point. Um, I think it was actually his sister, Nick, who said, you should like, start doing YouTube. Like we're all doing it. They're all earning money from it. And it's this thing that's starting to, it's like the next big thing. You know, back then it was like people talking about Bitcoin. It's like, (laughs) uh, okay. And then um, JC turns around and says, maybe to be honest, more out of loyalty than anything else. Like I'd kind of helped him get into the gym and stuff like that. And we were working together that he was like, I can't do it if I'm not doing it with Leon. Um, which is something that I will always appreciate. But I'm like, I feel like sometimes he felt like he owed me quite a lot in that moment because of our first initial steps into the industry. And then that was it. Like we started to have a conversation about what we would film, how we would film and um, decided, screw it. Let's just do how to do a squat, how to lose fat, how to improve your training, like real basic stuff. And music rights meant that we couldn't film like you can now. Like people going into a gym, I am fascinated, sometimes horrified, but fascinated by people's ability, like kids' ability now to walk into an open commercial gym, whack a camera down and just do a video. I'm like, that's, I've been in the industry for 20, 10, 10, 15 years. And that terrifies me. Like that's still, I can publicly speak, you can put me on a stage, you can do all of that sort of stuff because people are expecting to hear from me. But going into it like now, when I go out for long runs and I'm filming, I'm like, oh, is there is there anyone that could just kind of <laughs> jump out of the bush? Right, fuck it, you film it now, you know? Yeah. But the but it's so different now. Like back then we know it was <laughs> yeah, the gym, yeah, the gym closed at 10 p.m. We would film in the empty gym, maybe like five or six videos, 10 till midnight. And then we would edit in our lunch breaks. And this was kind of like the routine for about two years. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we would upload same time, like a TV directory back then. It's what the audience needed to know. It's like, when am I going to come back? When am I going to come back? And then, um, yeah, after about two and a half years, we got to about 70, 80,000 subscribers and an agency took us on. Um, Very quickly after that, we were offered a book deal, which basically for us, like we were doing 50 hours of PT a week, doing YouTube. We were, (laughs) everyone has that point, right? Where you are just hustling and we're like, we're getting traction. Things are happening. Reebok sent us some shoes. Nike sent us some stuff. We're like, (laughs) this is great. We're getting free stuff. Keep it going. And then um, the book deal gave us the financial security. Basically, we just said with our agents at the time who took us on, you need to negotiate enough that we can do this full time for a year so they managed to get us a deal that basically covered a basic salary for me and john to do it full time we're like a year of a hundred percent when we've been given 30 percent it it's got to work you know there's it's all or nothing so we both really just dived in went full time and then the next honestly the next four years of my life are just a, a a blur of of banter and experience it was unbelievable we got we flew all over the world we filmed with some of our biggest heroes we had so much fun we trained we filmed we laughed we got absolutely smashed you know and there was chaos and everything involved 
all the time. And then it got to the point, channel got to nearly half a million subscribers. Um, we made like a huge transition from CrossFit uh, from general bodybuilding, that's kind of where it started. The origin was like f- health and fitness generally in the section of bodybuilding and split routines and aesthetics. Then we moved into CrossFit and a lot of the momentum that we built just died. It, there was traditional bodybuilding space and CrossFit was so at loggerheads at that point um, that we kind of had to start again. So like the last 150,000 subscribers that we kind of pushed towards – all came from CrossFit. Everyone before was bodybuilding. So we kind of went from build, 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 build to like, you just went back three years and was like, fuck, we're back in this grind phase again. (laughs) And then at that point, we've got long-term partners with like, I've just got married and I'm about to have a child. John's just about to have a child as well. And then COVID hits. And like, just before COVID, we're filming our TV show. We're filming for Sky, which is like, our was our dream project. Fly into Finland. And then they close the borders. They're like, you've got 72 hours to get out of the country. COVID is going, you know, country's going into lockdown. And that was it. And at that point, you know, it's as it's, it's disrespectful as it can say in some ways because it's nothing personal. It was the best thing that could have ever happened because whether we want to say it publicly or not without it hurting a little bit, it wasn't working for a long time as a business because essentially it didn't start as a business. And unfortunately, when something doesn't start as a business, at some point it has to transition to a business. And neither me or JC ever approached it or wanted to approach it like a business because it was social and it was social media and it was me and my best friend just hanging out. So we always had this attitude of just riding the wave and the wave always just seemed to keep picking us up. Money Mm. kept coming in, opportunities kept coming in. Just when it felt like things were shifting and maybe not working, something would happen and pick things back up. Um, And for both of us, that level of anxiety was just exhausting. Um, so then when COVID happened, that was where it was like a real time to be able to reevaluate. And I went into this huge period of self-reflection where I was like, I only enjoyed it because I was doing it with him, but like 60, 70% of the bull crap that came with it and having to please people all the time and not being able to swear if I wanted to swear and not being able to wear certain things if I wanted to wear them. I'm not a very controversial character. But I was so muted as a person for so long through fear of being blacklisted on YouTube and not being able to work with these brands that if you swore on a video, they were like, oh, we can't work with that person. If you had a strong opinion about anything, oh, we can't work with that person. You know, so it was it was a lot of things that went on in the background that a lot of, for me and JC, a lot of our personality and day to day wants and needs, I guess, or just characters had to be suppressed. And you get to a point where you feel like you're only given 60% of the version of the person that you are. And then also we have children and there's that complex situation of, are you going to have the kids in content? Are you not going to have them in content? And then, you know, as soon as all of that sort of stuff came to bubble to the surface, I was like, I just don't enjoy it so much anymore. And then, you know, for nearly two, two years, we had to do it very digitally. And you suddenly realize that at that point we have, which is why it worked for so long, very different personalities and the way in which that we create content, the way in which we express ourselves personally. And then you fast forward to me revisiting the idea of wanting to live the other side of the world. And that's kind of like the final nail in the coffin. Like he can't sit there waiting for me to potentially make a decision to to do something else and move to the other side Mm. of the world. And it's like, you've got families. So it's kind of transitioned now to a point of we don't, the Lee Machines as it was, is not really a brand anymore. It's still an entity. Like people still recognize me as one half of the Lee Machines and JC as one half of the Lee Machines. But we don't actually work together anymore um still very good friends and we always will be but now it's like jc has his company i have my company and the lean machines like youtube content and everything like that still does this thing but i haven't uploaded a video for a very very long time now <laughs> that's wild um i used to i i i didn't know any of your um i didn't watch any of your bodybuilding content i was heavily into crossfit 
when you were starting to get into CrossFit as well. And I find it a bit odd that I was loving CrossFit at that time and I was watching your content and now jiu-jitsu we're kind of both like both blue belts at about the same time and um i remember at the time used to do like stuff with um craig ritchie and yeah. there was always like a bit of like he was doing his content you were doing yours and was there any sort of like um did you get on well with craig um i personally don't mind saying i didn't didn't dislike him um didn't dislike him at all he was actually a nice human he was actually to be honest one thing that transpired at over time the more times i met him i realized he was actually just quite an awkward person in in public so this is one of the things that you learn again where i said i was only able to be 60 percent of myself yeah. right so when you only know someone via a video or their video version like when i first swore in front of people who'd followed me for years i'm like it's like really jarring. Like I was Leon absolutely <laughs> smashed, like because he's suddenly just throwing an F bomb in for a laugh, right? It was a bit like that for Craig. So Craig Ritchie was similar to in a different a different context, but basically we we had, you know, do you know Matt does fitness as well? He's like absolutely massive. Yeah, Matt, Matt. Moore's yeah. Yeah. So Matt we had spoke to him when he had like sixteen thousand subscribers and was doing powerlifting in this grungy gym in the middle of nowhere and was like we want to learn to powerlift we love your content let's film together and i remember we met with matt at that point we had like quarter of a million subscribers like in that age everyone's oh you don't film with people with less subscribers there's no point but for us we wanted to learn to lift heavy and we wanted to learn to lift properly and we liked his execution and he wasn't even into the whole aesthetic thing. He was a PE teacher. He was just lifting heavy and all the rest of it. He's got ridiculous genes, that boy. And like, look at it now. Like He's an absolute monster. But when I met with him and we met with him, it was like, it made sense. It was like the content, the person that was on the camera before, it was the match the person that we met. But then we had a very similar situation with Craig where we had a I think it was like a call like this where we just caught up and was like maybe we should hang out like you've got you know 30 odd thousand subscribers we really loved the way that he vlogged was a and it re initially what brought us in because he used like a wide wide angle zoom lens was using a DSLR we were using a, a little bit more of a static cam at the time and I really wanted to learn his vlog style and um, we're like yeah let's hang out and he's just really not that forthcoming on a call and for some reason, for me, I took it really personally. I really did. Like this, <laughs> maybe it was like a youth thing. Maybe it was a bit like, I feel like I'm giving you a handout. We're the one with all the contacts. We're the ones with all these followers. And it was maybe a bit of like an ego thing that I needed to transition through, which I have done now. But I kind of, he was on the back foot with me bef before we'd even met. So then when we met, he was a little bit quiet, a little bit awkward, and I was just like, oh, okay, cool, fair enough. And I took it that personally he was a bit pretentious. So I was like completely gone at this point. And John was like, why do you have to be such a dick, Leon? Like, and I was just <laughs> give this guy a chance. And um, we'd filmed and like we'd hung out a few times. And then in my my opinion, it kind of got to a point where he, him and JC were cool. Like they – they got along really well, but we were like affiliated with um, Reebok and we went away and got some access for the for him and stuff like that before. And it didn't even ever really feel like it was like a thanks. And then I think the moment where I was like, yeah, I'm done now was it felt like maybe it was me being paranoid that when he'd really popped off um, and was doing so much better than us, like in that space, he just owned the CrossFit space and rightly so. He's very, very good in that space. I felt like sometimes when we were together, he would actively not have the camera on me or on us when we were in the same room. It was a bit like the, a bit, it felt a bit like the early days of YouTube when we first started that when there was huge vloggers in the room, they wouldn't feature you because it felt like competition. And at that point for me, I was like, I really struggled with the, the, the potential friendship there because it just felt really uncomfortable and i think in my i just got it way too in my own head and gone too far the opposite way um but you know this is this is the youtube space you know like everybody yeah. kind of has different styles different approaches and different personalities and i think my problem is is i used to always take people based on 
either very, very initial face value or the version of them that I'd seen online. And unfortunately, when you meet people in, in person, it can often be very, very different. And I used to find that very jarring. So it was a it was a hard transition for me. <laughs> I know there was always just like a I can't remember my my wife absolutely loves your content when she was obsessed with CrossFit for a few years and she used to watch you like religiously. Um, so she's pretty jealous actually. I'm talking to her, so she said all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I remember her saying like she she mentioned something that it was a bit it was a bit awkward in a couple of vlogs or a couple of videos where kind of what you said like you were being cut out of certain yeah. things and but you were he was in your videos more and stuff like that. And she was like, you can see it, Dan, you can see it. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I think, I think to a certain degree, you can see what you want to see with social media. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same as when you look at data, you know, you can look at data six different ways depending on how, what it is that you're trying to prove, Yeah, you know, but there, I felt, you know, in some ways I felt like it was a bit like that. Um, maybe it's just, you know, again, naivety when you're growing into a space and things are starting to pop off and explode for you like i remember when we first got like that you know you've got two ways that you can go you can close and batten down the hatchets and hold on to everything for yourself for fear for you know fear it might disappear or you can open up and express like where and we just went the opposite way like when people when we started to explode my friends have never been happier because they were getting brand new trainers every month because i was like nike have just sent a a load of trainers who want some kit who wants some of this and i wanted to give out yeah, i wanted to cool. bring everyone around me whereas maybe just his approach was a little bit more insular at that point because he didn't have like i had a john you know i had a jc and he had a leon so you could always kind of help each other through those transition periods but i would say that from craig's side his wasn't a small growth it was like one moment his channel was growing really slowly and then boom it just yeah, exploded. He, was, he was training with Matt Fraser and yeah you're training yeah you're training with Matt Fraser you're friends with Tia Platumi and like that kind of transition is jarring you know it doesn't happen for everyone and when it does happen is a lot to try and adjust to so it probably took him about 18 months to even get to the point where it's like the fuck just happened and then you've got the hustle hustle kit mate in fairness I, I bought a lot of hustle kit back in the day bought a lot of hustle kit you know i'm fucking it was, it was good stuff i like that exactly that well you see he was quite clever with that because he used to do drops didn't he so he'd never like have a constant brand he, he, he wouldn't sell it all the time he would just do a date and he would just be like once it's gone it's gone so yeah, you'd be like oh fuck it. if i want to get it you'd have to buy it oh it's the same as like remember gymshark like i remember when gymshark yeah. first started you go to body power expo and it's just like it's the only place you're going to get your zebra g-string vests it's like <laughs> they're going to be there for the weekend and then when it's gone it's gone you know like that that kind of sales model at that point culturally was perfect and I think it still works sometimes with the right brands. If the stuff's cool enough and people want to get it enough, then to have that scarcity of like, you have to have it now or it's not coming back. I think it's quite manual and quite old school. And I think it's nice in a, way, in a world that's completely automated where everything's at your fingertips at any point, apart from when you live in Costa Rica. And if you want a parcel, you have to order it five weeks in advance. You know, like <laughs> that's, that's something that's quite beautiful about that as well. But it's, it's that, you know, like, I kind of really liked that style, that growth of the the hustle brand. I thought it was done very, very cleverly, but it was also very, very good kit. You know, that's the difference. Yeah, like when you've got when you've got the cultural social stuff that can very, very quickly be seen as merch, very quickly if you do it badly. And what I thought was impressive with that whole evolution was that it was instantly gym apparel. It was never a merch thing, right? Yeah, no, it was it was good. It was, in fairness, crazy content, mate. I watched so much of it around that time because I was I was totally immersed in CrossFit. Yeah, and you know, it, it kind of there was like a period where it, I felt that CrossFit was just booming, and it was just you know you had Matt Fraser killing it, and you had all this stuff happen, especially in the UK. Got us, you know, you had Craig and yourself was all getting involved, and it just felt like it was like it was just going to grow. And I feel now it's, it's kind of like, I don't know if it's just me, but it kind of like stopped dead. I felt at that point where they were coming to the end of that, like Reebok association, I felt they were going to get like a big deal with Nike or Nike or Noble was going to be. Big. Yeah. And it was going to be big. And then it kind of just never really happened. And then it's, 
it's gone flat and then high rocks has come out of the woodwork and i don't know i just feel like the 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 whole scene of CrossFit's kind of changed, even like OGs of CrossFit, you know, even yeah. locally and elsewhere have kind of like steered away from CrossFit a little bit. Why do you, why do you think that is? Um, I think I will talk from my personal perspective and I'll talk from my client's perspective because obviously I have an in, in with the community and stuff like that with the people that I work with because I used to have a lot of people come to me for CrossFit coaching and then it transitions. Now, I think there's one thing which is going to sound like an excuse, but I genuinely believe it is an age association. Like there's, there's a common denominator that happens with CrossFit with a lot of people that if you start it young, like jujitsu in some ways, right? If you start it young, it kind of ends up just being like a part of your life because you've gone through that beat up phase where, you know, you can go and put a bar over your head and you're like, great, it's just natural. I got into CrossFit when I was 26, 27 years old, and I thought my body was going to explode the first time I tried to do a snatch. <laughs> yeah, no, that felt, so, yeah. so you were already at a position when we were doing it that everything was going backwards to go forwards. You weren't just walking into it and learning, like getting on the mats, you know, a 17-year-old, you're like, oh, cool, I need you to, you know, hip bump and and roll someone. Okay, cool. And you ask someone who's 40, well, how do, I, how do I extend my hips and lift this arm and trap this foot at the same time? What the fuck are you trying to do to me, right? It's, it's a bit like that. So when CrossFit kind of first came in, it was the most disruptive scene that we'd had in the fitness industry for years. If you think about it, it was just bodybuilding. That's all it was. Everyone was doing split routines, split routines, static lifting, compound lifts, all that sort of stuff. So to bring something in that had an aesthetic appeal – a performance appeal that wasn't just sitting and bench pressing was like, okay. And then you get people throwing big bars overhead. You're like what people were traditionally deadlifting was then being put on people's shoulders. It was cool. And then I think that's what kind of really picked the wave up where everyone just gets into it. But then I think it gets to a point, which is what it did to did for me where You've got all of these other stresses and responsibilities in your life where you kind of just want to feel good and you want to go in and do a workout that feels good. And if you're not doing, I think of it a bit like rugby, if you're not doing it four or five times a week, every time you do it, you feel like shit. It's like rugby. If you're not being tackled four or five times a week and being conditioned to that impact, it just hurts. And I think what a lot of people's obsession shifted from have to do it all the time, I have to learn all the skills. They suddenly get to a point where they suddenly realize that, you know what, I'm never just gonna, I'm never going to be able to do a rig muscle up. I'm never going to be able to do a bar muscle up. It's just never going to happen for me. And then they get to the point where like, well, I can't do it every day. I've got kids. I've got a business. I've got all these other things. And CrossFit becomes, in my opinion, really hard to just do as like a class two times a week. You know, and it's like uh, my wife used to love CrossFit and then she would go and go, right, I've had my little girl. I can only go on a Tuesday and a Thursday. So she goes in and she's like, want to do a really sweaty Metcon. I was snatching for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and like to the general population, it's a closed door straight away because they're going yeah. in and they're just messing around with a PVC pipe or an empty barbell for an hour. And yes, it's great. You're working on the skills. But what a lot of people struggled with with CrossFit is I don't think it transitioned to the everyday person. It always stayed at this and wanted to operate at this point of RX. And like people do say like, oh, yeah, no, you can do a kip in toes to bar or a kip in chest to bar instead of doing a bar muscle up. Or you don't have to go overhead or you don't have to use the right weight or the same amount of weight. But it's still closed doors. It still was a, a real hard someone going in for a workout that had toes to bars and they couldn't do toes to bar. They're like, it's ruined my workout because it's another barrier. And there was not, I don't think it ever transitioned or diluted itself enough for the general culture to be able to stick with it. And then you just exhausted all the time. So then when high rocks comes in running, okay, I can run, might not like it, but I can run and look at all this skill acquisition on all these exercises. The hardest exercise they've got is a wall ball, yeah, you know, fucking, yeah. And it's straight away, you can see why it's blown up because it's simple. It's got elements it's like the of complication, that. The complicated parts of CrossFit, out, yeah. hasn't it? It's, it's people who, you know, a mum of 35, like you said, had a couple of kids, doesn't want to go in and, and 
you know, it's, it's daunting to do snatching or cleaning jacks and stuff like that. They they can just it's do exactly that. Work. Yeah, and like the minimum requirements for CrossFit were that you had to you had to do everything. You had to at least try everything. And unfortunately, in the culture that we're in now, people should have should have the right to choose. And CrossFit, especially in a lot of the spaces that I went, was one dimensional. And when it's one dimensional, if it's not simple, it's not going to progress. It's like with jujitsu. If you go into a jujitsu gym and every single time you do a session, it's like, well, you have to be able to bear and bolo or you're not going to be able to come to the classes. And you go in, you're like, well, what's the fucking point? You know, it's like a good professor is going to give you options. And, and with CrossFit, like if you can't snatch, you can't snatch. <laughs> so it's basically it's like well, it's a snatch class <laughs> i think over time as well your body just breaks down i used to remember like just feeling so exhausted like jiu-jitsu you, you're tired but it's it's when you would do crossfit five days a week or six days a week and you'd be hitting just an hour a day you know i'd get to a sunday and i felt like my body was just broken i was getting like a yeah. sore lower back i was got sore shoulders i had you know just mental fatigue fog you know i i was kind of towards the end of my crossfit stuff i was dreading going back on a monday because yeah. even though like i just was never repairing I, was, I felt like i was never repairing but that at the same time i felt like if i didn't go all the time i wasn't progressing and yeah, I, yeah, the yeah, thing that finished CrossFit for me was um, I got a bit of the flu and I was off for about two weeks and it affected my, like, just my chest. I've got asthma as well. And uh, when I went back, I felt like I went back six months. Yeah. I still had the te technical stuff and I was still as strong, but my cardio was completely gone. And then I was getting beaten by people that I was absolutely smashing. And yeah. I was like, I don't know mentally if I can handle this. Whereas in jiu-jitsu, you, you still have your skill acquisition that's always going to be there. So your cardio will catch up, but if you're better than someone, you're kind of better than someone, you know? Yeah. Um, but with CrossFit, once you lose that, it's gone. It's like, it's like starting over and you will gain it back. Of course you will, but of you, it's, it's like every time, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a, it's a perpetual cycle. And you also, I, I think like in a nutshell, what the, the problem, I say the problem with CrossFit, I think it's been great culturally and it's helped a lot of people work on their conditioning as much as, you know, just doing static lifting. So I think there was like, there's loads of positives that came from it. But unfortunately, I think what it, the biggest hinge point which made it hard and which is where they're still probably struggling now is it was a competitive sport and it was always taught and delivered as a competitive sport. Whereas most other things, like you look at the blow up of jiu-jitsu now, like jiu-jitsu jiu culturally has exploded since UFC days and everything like that, right? And the difference is you you go into a gym and you're not told that you have to fight. You're told to show up and learn the skills. It's a bit like if jiu-jitsu said, well, you can only ever come into jiu-jitsu uh, this jiu-jitsu academy if you plan to fight at some point that is a totally different approach to the everyday jeremy who's 50 years old and decides wants to use, do something else to keep his brain active right and the thing is that you could to a certain degree do that with crossfit but it was really really hard to have that transition where it can be like this is the model for the general population and this is the model for the very small population that want to fight. Uh, um, with like with, with like with CrossFit, it was it was everybody did the same thing, and you kind of just went at it a hundred percent. And I just think it just doesn't exist like that in this world. It, those kind of models don't work. So like the two percent who continue to do it, they are absolute savages, and they are incredible at it, and they've gone through that churn rate of sucking at all the different exercises to being able to do chest to bars every day if they want to and their body just thanks them for it whereas like <laughs> for you or i when you're dealing with mobility ailments and issues that you have to figure out with your body do you really want to sacrifice six months of progression with your training to deal with your thoracic mobility and overhead position we're like no i want to go in and have a bloody good workout so that's when you start banging that drum constantly and you get to that point where you end up like you say just constantly in pain and then unfortunately the general population as i've experienced with many people then go oh, it was it was it was crossfit's fault and like for me, I fell out of love with CrossFit and left. And I was like, it wasn't because of CrossFit. It was because CrossFit would just highlight all of my weaknesses that I needed to work on over and over again. And I refused to keep working on them. So at some point you have to just say, 
it probably you probably don't care about it enough to continue. Yeah, that's exactly it. Now yeah, with jujitsu, I spent <laughs> I spent what three months getting put in arm bars fucking constantly. And if I didn't care enough about jujitsu, I would have stopped jujitsu because I was just getting arm barred by everyone. But because I care enough about it, I then go, right, okay, so what am I doing wrong? And admittedly, really annoyingly, all I had to remember is T-Rex arms. You know, so it's a really simple cue <laughs> that often saves you a lot of hassle, but you have to want to learn. You have to want to adapt. And I think people just get to the point where they just feel so crap that they're like, nah, I don't care about it enough. I just want to go and have a good workout. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I think the difference with jujitsu, mate, and you mentioned this at the very beginning, but there's like a self-defense element to jujitsu as well, where there's probably not with CrossFit and there's like there is a reason to care about it a little bit more because of yeah, that. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, mate. Um, we'll let you go in a second because we can hear the kids are, are knocking about in the background there somewhere. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> no, it's no, fine, no, mate. No. Um, but uh, but tell us real quick if you've got any like future plans or what's going on over the next sort of few months to a year. So, next <clears throat> six months, um, all in Costa Rica. Uh, there's like a big question around whether I was coming back to the UK and stuff. And in, uh, in, after six months, we've decided this is where we want to live. Um, so now it's a case of find the right opportunity, find a property, uh, get a visa, which allows us to be here more. So I'm going to be focused over here 100% until next Easter, where we'll come back and visit family and friends. I'll go back straight to the Jiu Jitsu Academy and hang out with the boys. Which be great. <laughs> um, Main thing that I'm training for at the moment is I'm going to be going over to Nevada and to in the Ultra X 220K um, around the Grand Canyon and stuff, which will be a pretty savage five day event. That'll be fun. Um, and otherwise, like Jiu Jitsu, I'm in, I'm full on in my um, blue blue grind phase now, where I've been working quite closely with my professor over here, who has essentially opened the door to me to coach there eventually, um, and you know, sometimes it's frowned upon within the industry and the martial art is like, what's your approach? Are you approaching, are you training to fight? Are you training to just live well and, and be a bit of a savage or are you trying to progress? And I've kind of gone from a position of just showing up, defending the blue belt status and trying not to get the blues constantly to my whole focus is to gain all of the skills and knowledge and acquisition that I can become a purple belt, which, you know, they always say don't chase the belts and the reason is for me at the moment, I'm like purple belt means I can teach and I can teach effectively. So it's a, a real shift in mindset, which I wasn't expecting to really have so early into my blue blue belt kind of era. I thought it was going to be like, now I'm at blue, I get to start to just solely build my game and just have fun and enjoy it. Um, but now I'm like, I've got one month focus for every month. Last month, all I was focusing on was side control or a north south north south side control with a cross face, which is something that I love to do, which is horrible for people. But you can control everyone and such different weights. You get the position right, and it feels great. And I was just working on two different submissions to work from there. This month, I'm I'm solidifying mount, high mount, and then attacks from high mount. And essentially, my whole next six months of training is picking all of the major systems or elements of all of the major systems and making them absolutely bulletproof. And for me, it's a nice way to learn and progress because you feel like you're getting constant feedback every single time you roll. Whereas what I was doing was essentially learning the skill that the professor was teaching us. I may or may not use it. You know, this is the thing. You get to a point where you're like, not everything is for you. Not everything suits your game. And then you go and roll for five rounds at the end and it's all just reactive. And it's, you're trying to do the things that you want to do and they don't work and then it becomes a scramble and then it becomes a fight and all that sort of stuff. Whereas now I just spent a month working on my side control north, north south and the first week was try to get it on lower belts. Second week was try to get it on people at a similar sort of standard to me. And then by the end of the month, get it on the heavier guys, you know, the big, big heavy boys and some of the upper belts. And now I'm nearly finished finished july and i've got a position that i'm like no matter what happens i can return to that position and hold anyone and that's really beautiful in jiu-jitsu and then also as well the big thing for me is i could now teach that to anyone and that's where i feel like when you're 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 going down that either you're going to compete or you're going to coach 
So for me, it's like solidifying all of these systems and all of this knowledge as much as I possibly can, because I have to be able to dilute it to a brand new person who's never done it before. And it's really, it's really exciting because it's such a different experience for me. I've always coached. I've always done one-to-one stuff. I've always been used to being in front of people. So that side of things was always there. But if you ask me to teach, like, I don't know, like day one jiu-jitsu, hip bump, escape, right? I would have missed five or six steps because I'm going, well, I just do it in like this this way and push people off. So like now all of my training is purely hit all the notes, hit all of the points, repetition, repetition, repetition. And then so by the time I get to that purple belt stage, however long that takes, I'll have all of the systems in play that when I stand in front of people to coach, I'm like, I know I'm going to be able to do this because I've done it a hundred times myself. So it's a, yeah, it's a really nice stage. I feel like this is the kind of jujitsu that, you know, when you people talk about building their game, I always thought it was going to be the approach from stand up to take down to position to submission. But I'm kind of in that position now where I'm like, well, my game is actually building all of the skills and knowledge to be able to coach, which is, which is new and I'm, and I'm enjoying it. So that I'm going to be focusing a lot on that for the rest of the year. Yeah, no, it's awesome, man. I do a bit of coaching. It's it's great. I, I absolutely love it. I think yeah. um, competition wise, I'm not that keen these days. My body hurts too much. But <laughs> coaching, I take a lot of satisfaction from coaching and seeing others do well. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I had this very open conversation with a professor and just said, competition will be something that if I rock up, I'm just going to rock up at the weight that I am, and I'll just have a go. I don't mm. care about prepping for it i haven't got the time and the capacity and also when i'm doing the running it's exactly that like there's no guarantee that you'll get injured but it's the highest risk that you're going to get injured in jiu-jitsu is in competition because that person wants to rip your limbs off and i <laughs> like now there's a competition in a couple of months and i'm like i can't compete i'm going to be a month out from running a 220k and the the ego stamp that i get and the satisfaction from doing a competition does not outweigh the fact that I might not be able to do the run event that I've got coming up. So I've just got too many things that I have to keep my body as much in one tact, one piece as I can. Um, that makes it really hard to then get into the, the competition world. But I'd like to think at some point, once the once I get to that point where I've had enough of ultra, if I ever get to that point, then I'll be like, yeah, just get on the comp floor and be a savage dad and give it a go. Yeah, I'll be a star, mate. Love it. And mate, you mentioned brick by brick as well. Tell us about your services real quick and then sort of the stuff that you you offer if people wanted to get in touch. Yeah, so it kind of started as just pure running programming. And, you know, obviously I've been a personal trainer, sports nutrition coach for like 12, 13 years now. So I've done all of the original stuff back in the day all composition, body fat reduction, muscle building. And it just didn't, I, it didn't get me. Um, I gotta be honest. Like I just, I didn't enjoy that aspect of it because what I realized is that there's so many psychological cues attached to people's training that that's what I wanted to be involved in. So the way that I coach now is I coach people from, you know, running their first half marathon up to who people who want to run and do exactly the same as what I've done and more in the ultra endurance space and performance nutrition space. But the way that I kind of put all of my coaching under one bracket is it's performance based coaching, whether you want to improve your performance in a chosen sport or you want to just pr- improve your performance in life. That's kind of where I work now. So it's a case of don't come to me if you want to just lose a little bit of body fat and look great in the summer i'm like that's great you're going to come back every single year i want people who actually want to progress in life and in their chosen sport and feel better about their bodies as a byproduct of what they can do opposed to just purely how it looks so yeah it's a it's a nice space to be coaching in it's it's phenomenally busy which is always always really nice and now moving into you know with with um, jiu-jitsu as well moving into i'm going to be doing my first fight camp for 10 to 15 people getting ready for a competition in October. Now, some people say, well, you're a blue belt. You know, how are you going to help a purple belt or a black belt get ready for a competition? And the thing is, is like when it comes to conditioning for something, you you remove all of the skill acquisition 
that's required to compete within the sport. Cause like I still work, I work with surfers. I can barely stand up on a fucking surfboard, but I look at what's, what's, what's required. Oh, that person needs to have good core, core strength and coordination. They need to be able to pop up explosively and then they need to be able to balance and they need to have good strength in their lats, their mid upper back and their shoulders. So you basically dissect the skill and then you just look at it biomechanically and how does the body need to function and how's it going to function correctly and so i just basically done that moved it into jujitsu and now everyone will be conditioning guess what they're going to be competing for five minutes okay so all of their condition elements are going to be intensity for six to seven minutes so that five minutes feels good we use each other's body weight we do a ton of grip work work strength work and it's that kind of stuff so it's um exciting it's transitioning and i'm enjoying nice. it nice yeah, mate, sounds awesome. Leon, lovely to meet you, mate, and I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, that's fantastic, mate. Thank you. That's a privilege. Thanks so much for your time, gents. Yeah, thanks for coming on, buddy. No worries. <laughs>